Do you have a Radanga teacher? This little boy. Ask him. No. He he. He just watches. One day you should get a Radanga teacher. Okay? Okay. Ivo. <laughs> Ivo. 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 Okay, enough, enough. <laughs> Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale. Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Paschachade Satarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Where are we? We sent you a little map this morning. You should have received that little map this morning. Ton de Noor, Ton de Noor is... Historically, <clears throat> around the time of Ramanujacharya, uh, one of the places where the king, whose palace and headquarters was in Melkote, had one of his outpost administrative facilities in this Ton de Noor location because he had a big kingdom and he had to administrate a big kingdom. So he had little outposts. This was one of those little outposts. And it's a place where Ramanujacharya came, we'll hear the circumstance, and spent 12 years. And during those 12 years, he had some interaction with the local king. And the local king, this area was predominantly under influence of Jain religion. Shh, Mataji, Mataji. Predominantly, it was under the influence of Jain religion. And it's not that the king was a member of the Jain religion, but they wanted to have some influence upon the king with their Jain religion. And it happened otherwise. With a series of events that we'll hear. And the king became a disciple of Ramanujacharya. And in the course of time, the assets of the king were encouraged by Ramanujacharya to establish five temples in, this, in, the, in his kingdom, Krishna temples or Vishnu temples. And so he did. But a little background. Um, we're here because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came here. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to two of those temples, at least, per 
the indication of Chaitanya Charitamrita. The commentaries in this section of Chaitanya Charitamrita says, it, it's not that an exhaustive list of every single place that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited is included in the text. But some are mentioned, and some prominent ones are particularly mentioned, and there's many others that he also visited. So two of them, known by a different name during that time than our present time, he visited. So that's why we're here. In the earlier visit, we also heard of uh, one of the temples that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited, this Ranganath temple, Adi Ranga, and the activities of one of Ramanujacharya's great disciples, Vedanta Deshika, and we heard something about his history and his contributions and his transcendental personality. And now we're going to hear something about Ramanujacharya himself coming to this area. And what he did. How many are still with us? Because this the, during the earlier part of the Shyatra, there were a good number of devotees from Tamil Nadu. How many here raise your hand from Tamil Nadu? I don't see too many hands. Some. Okay. Okay. So a lot of this is familiar with you. From the time that Ramanujacharya and others before him, Mahapurna and others after him, his, his principal disciples, they were residing many places, but one of those many places was Sri Rangakshetra, worshipping Ranganath. We, we heard of two misfortunes that happened when kings who had armies from the north invaded with the idea of taking two things, taking the valuables that were in the treasury of Ranganath, and the second was smashing the deities. And, you know... Changing people, changing per persons to Shaiva, Shaiva, Shaivite faith. Now, there are different persons that have a uh, position of worship of Lord Shiva. We're going to hear of one. In the period of time around Ramanujacharya's time, everything was nice, except there was a, a king, the king of the Chola dynasty, and he was a, a bigot, bigot, bad guy. I'm right, everybody else is wrong is a bigot. Just ask me. I'm right and everybody else is wrong. It's bigotry. There's other names, but that's one of them. And his, his thing was, in his dynasty, it's a long succession of kings in his dynasty, but they're, they're all Shaivites, but he had a particular brand. So, in those who were, during his time, those, and even subsequently, those who are worshippers of Lord Shiva have different ideas. It's not, it's all one. Some ideas, amongst these kings, some ideas were that the goal is to become one with Lord Shiva. Another goal is to attain Shivaloka. Another goal is to get benediction from Lord Shiva for worldly things. Then there's different brands. This particular fellow, um, it just, just gives his name as the Chola King. His brand was convert everybody or else death. And he had a, he had a plan for how to do that. His plan was he had this little declaration, very short declaration, 
There's no God greater than Shiva. Sign it or you're dead. Some people signed it because they didn't want to be dead. Some people just were intimidated and ran. Some person signed it because they thought they're going to get good stuff from this king. Grants and land and wealth and you know, the king is going to distribute his mercy. So I'll sign it. So there are different responses. But it was his standard program. His son, it gives the name of his son, Vikrama Chola, said to his father, this is a waste of time, getting everybody to sign, I accept Lord Shiva as the supreme, there's no God superior to him. What good is that going to do you? Because faith in Vaishnavism rests upon Ramayana and Namalvar. And so you're not going to change that. They're, they're pillars, and Ramayana is going to last longer than you, and now Malvar was there before you and will last after you, so Dad, you're, you're wasting your time. But he was a, you know, he was a bigot. He was a very stubborn, my way or, or dead. Not my way or the highway, just, you're dead. Sign it. One of his ministers, interestingly, according to the, this, these bi biographies, was a disciple of Quraysha. Now, those of you that are from Tamil Nadu, you know who Quraysha is. And even if you're not from Tamil Nadu, you may know. He was a disciple, an important disciple of Ramanujacharya. And he was a, a disciple of Quraysha, was one of, one of the ministers of this Chola king. And he gave some advice, essentially saying, you're also wasting your time going around gathering signatures, so what? If you get two signatures, send somebody to Sri Rangam, invite Ramanujachari and Kuresha to come here, and if they sign, that's significant. Because, you know, Jirajarati Shrestas, if they sign, others will follow. The king liked the idea. He sent some messengers to Sri Rangam. And the messengers weren't polite. They came banging on the door of the ashram or monastery, demanding the king has given an order. Ramanujacharya should come at once to see him. And fortunately, <clears throat> some people had their lights on. They ran quickly to where Ramanujachari was, gave him a heads up. The king is, is demanding your presence. Kuresha was there. He was preparing bath water for Ramanujachari at that time. And he understood immediately what this, the implication of this, the politics. So while Ramanujachari was getting ready for his bath, he very quickly put on Ramanujacharya's sannyas dhoti, took his sannyas danda, and went to the messengers saying, I'm, I'm Ramanujacharya, what can I do for you? Because they didn't have photo ID, they just... They, he misrepresented who he was. And after he had gone, Ramanujacharya asked, where's Kuresha? And they said, this is what happened, this is what Kuresha did. And... and uh, the disciple was Dasarati, another one of a principal disciples of Ramanujacharya, said, best if you disappear quickly, because this king is wicked, and he's, you know, he sent messengers to your door, and it's only going to be a matter of time before they figure out that the person that came to greet them is not Ramanujacharya. So Ramanujacharya was very disturbed. Oh, what will come of Kuresha and Mahapurna in this war of bigotry? Sri Rupa. In this war of bigotry. Let me wear the white garments of Kuresha 
so that I will not be discovered by that heretic chief's followers. So he put on Kresha's white dhoti. He went to his deity first and Lord Vardaraj and offered standard prayers from the prayers of the Alvars, which he lived with, and then offered a particular personal prayer. The Chola king right now is very powerful. I leave it to you as to how and when you will do away with him. I will now leave this country and in another place I will, if necessary, resort to measures, math, measures that will hasten this tyrant's destruction. But he, so he didn't say get him. He just, you know, in time, if it's necessary, I'll take steps to bring this tyrant's destruction. But I leave it up to you. And with a few associates, he left. It didn't take too long for the messengers of the king, the Chola king, to realize that that wasn't Ramanuja. So they went to find where's Ramanuja. And they followed Ramanuja. And since that far, Ramanuja got to a, a place that was a shallow river, sandy bottom, and Ramanuja and his followers saw the, 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 the soldiers, the representatives of the king, coming after them. So what to do? According to this biography, he addressed his disciples this way. Let us take a handful of sand and chant this mantra, one of the Alvar's mantras, Vishnu Chitta Mantra, that has some mystical power and will throw some sand along with chanting this mantra from the Alvars and will leave it up to the Supreme Lord. So the, the, the verse from Vishnu Chitta's writings is, is given and they threw some sand. Now the persons in hot pursuit got to the place where they threw the sand and their feet got stuck. And they couldn't move. It wasn't tar. It was mystical sand. And they said, oh, they've done some trick. Now we can't pursue them. And after some time, they went back to the king to report what happened. So maybe you saw, many of you probably saw, something that Guru Das sent out. It was a map showing the footsteps of Ramanuja Chari in the path that he followed. Largely, they followed along the banks of a river and then they got to some hill, hilly tract of land. And the hilly tract of land is known as Nila Giri Hills. When they got to Nila Giri Hills, it was just wilderness. In course of time, Ramanujacharya and some of his followers got separated. They, they lost each other and they started spending some time looking for each other again. In course of time, one of that search party met some forest men in the wilderness. And lo and behold, they were plowing a field. So they approached the forest men plowing the field and asked them who they were. And they identified right away that they were disciples of one of Ramanuja Acharya's disciples living in the forest. Kind of like jungle men, but plowing the field. And the, this disciple of his was named Nalan Chakravarti. So as soon as they said this is who they were, then the devotees who were with Ramanujacharya, at least his party, they identified he's our spiritual, Ramanuja is our spiritual master and we're, we're searching for him. So 
So how is how is Sri Rangam? How is the Ranganath? And how is everything? And they were frustrated. We can't find our Ramanujacharya. What to speak of God? We left the place because the Chola king and his tyranny and right now we can't even find Ramanujacharya. So the forest men who are disciples of Nalan Chakravarti, they stopped their plowing and immediately they assisted in searching because they were familiar with the wilderness. And for six days, nonstop, meaning specifically, they didn't drink water, they didn't eat anything. They searched and they searched and they searched all day long and into the night and the next morning and the next day. And on the sixth evening, they still hadn't found Ramanujacharya. But they heard off in the distance some voices in a wilderness. That's kind of unusual. And so they followed the voices. And when they followed the voices, uh, they saw a fire because it was cold at night up in the mountains. And they, they were attracted to get warm because it was cold. So as they approached... Ramanujachari had already found that place and he was there. So there, there, was, there was a little reunion of the search party and Ramanujachari and his few that were with him. And they were received very warmly, besides the nice fire, and some food and some dry clothing. And then there was, you know, some direct conversation. Where have you all calling, coming from? From Ramaduja Charya. Ramaduja remained silent. He didn't disclose his identity. He's still wearing white and, you know, doesn't, you know, being care very cautious. They said, these followers, they're disciples of Nalan Chakravarti, said the, the parting words of our spiritual master were Ramanuja Acharya should be cherished in our hearts as the grand guru and that his holy feet are our only way to salvation and this is the way that we know Ramanuja Acharya so the disciples of Ramanuja Acharya were very happy and they noticed Ramanujachari was seated in this group and they were very happy. But um, they had still, you know, to continue on in their journey. So the next morning on their journey, the forest dwelling disciples of Nalan Chakravarti <coughs> wanted to take the, the Ramanuja and his followers to their chieftain. So their chieftain lived some distance away and when they arrived at the place where their chieftain was living, he wasn't there. He was off hunting somewhere. And so they um, were led by the chieftain's wife, doesn't give his name, um, she, he, she, the, finally the chieftain came back and said, you know, I'm, I'm back, but look at all these people and we can't eat unless they eat. And they said, I'm sorry, we can't eat what you eat. You know, they're, they're, they're Sri Vaishnavas are very strict about what they eat and from whom they eat. Not only what, but who cooks it. So the, the chieftain understood Oh, this is their standard. So there's a Brahmana family also residing here in the forest or in the wilderness. Take them to this person. He sent a messenger from his group of forest dwellers to go to where the Brahmana resided. 
His name was Katalai Vari, a Brahmana named Katavai Vari. So they arrived at the Brahmana's home. Along with, you know, edibles, at least in the category, that Ramanujacharya could eat. But they had to be cooked. They, you know, the, the, the forest-dwelling people that weren't vegetarian couldn't be the ones to cook. So the Brahmana, he took the groceries and a little messenger to, to get them to this Brahmana's home. And when they reached the Brahmana's home, uh, they were greeted by his wife. So this is a celebrity. You're going to hear her name several times. She's a disciple of Ramanujacharya living in the forest. And when she came forward, her name is Kangu Pirati. Is that the right pronunciation? Yes? Close, close enough. Kangu Pirati. So they're not disclosing who they are or anything, but the, the, she's a Brahmani, and they're Ramanuja followers. And she saw, because she was trained at least a little bit by Ramanuja Acharya, as soon as she saw these sa saintly people, she paid obeisances, prostrated herself, and asked, can I cook for you? They looked at each other, and they didn't say yes, they didn't say no. Um, so they, they finally said, no, you know, you're, you're a Brahmana, a Vaishnavi Brahmana, but we don't know what your standards are. So they declined. Then she asked them, who's your guru? And they right away said, Ramanujachari. He was in their midst, but they didn't say, and there he is. They just said that he's our guru. And they like they wanted to know from her, how did you end up here? How did you become a Vaishnavi Brahmana living in the in a forested area? How'd that happen? And then she told this a long story. She told her story. My husband and I lived in a place where for a long period of time there was a drought. And it was very difficult living there. So we went to Sri Rangam where we could get some rescue. So we, there we lived for some time. And while I lived there, or while we lived there, I noticed one sadhu, and I came to know his name was Ramanujacharya, and he had this practice every day, so, something like 11 different homes, he would go and beg alms. And I was watching, he was a very stately, amazing looking person. And I saw kings and wealthy people coming up to him and bowing at his feet. And then one day he came to our door to ask to request alms. And so when he came to our door to request alms, I was very enthusiastic. And I tried to offer him some alms, but I... So I asked him, why'd you come to my door? Because you have so many people falling at your feet and I'm a poor person. And then Ramanujacharya explained, my purpose in going is not getting something, my purpose is giving something. And the something, something I like to give, my, my duty as a sannyasi, is to give knowledge of the personality of Godhead and the means to achieve him. So she, she asked him, can you, can you explain all of that to me? Am I worthy? So he started explaining all that to her. Looking upon me graciously, Ramanujacharya, oppressed upon me once more the Dvaya Mantra. It doesn't say what Dvaya Mantra is. What's Dvaya Mantra? Oh. The mantra that you're not supposed to say. Om Namo Narayanaya. That's it. Dvaya Mantra. He gave that he she he gave that mantra to her, and she's a poor Brahmana lady, and he's given her Brahmana Diksha and other holy names and teachings about the personality of Godhead. 
So she made a request. You're so kind, you're so merciful. Can you give me some item that after you're gone, I can think of you and remember you? So very kindly, she's narrating, out, narrating this to all these followers of Ramanujacharya, including Ramanujacharya, incognito. He very kindly gave me his padukas. And since that time, since that very day, every cooking I do, I offer to his padukas as my deity before I eat. So that was her story. Oh, oh then after the... the um, Drought cleared, we went back to our ancestral home. But before I went to our ancestral home, he visited our home one more time. And when he visited our home one more time, I confessed to him, I forgot everything. Could you say it again? And so he very kindly said it again. And she requested, can I now cook for you? So hearing all of this, Ramadujacharya consented and said to one of his disciples, watch her, see what's the procedure, because it's not just she's a Vaishnavi and she's his disciple. What's the, what's the procedure that she's following? So he went, watched, and it was the, the, the house that she was living in, in the forest, was not very well lit. So she went, after she cooked, she went into a, a room that wasn't well lit. And there, there was these two dark objects, and she made an offering before these two dark objects and came back. So Ramanujacharya said, what are those two dark objects? Like, was it, what's her deity? Who is she making this offering unto? So Ramanujacharya personally went out, went to her, because he's at their house, and um, asked her, when you went in and made this offering, what was it you were offering? She said, it's the sandals of Ramanujacharya, because she didn't recognize him. Many years had passed, he's wearing white, etc. She didn't recognize, this is, Ram this is her guru. So she, she went, brought him in with a little lamp and showed him, these are Ramanuja's sandals. And I don't eat without first offering everything to Ramanujacharya's padukas. He said, very well, that's nice. But my disciples may not be satisfied with all of this. Can you tell me what was the mantra that he gave you? So she told him the mantra that he gave her. And he said, and did, Ramanuja is your guru. Have you seen him? She said, I haven't seen him in a long time. He said, these padukas are, fit me, but where is, but where is, where is Ramanuja? She said, I don't know. He said, I'm Ramanuja. And she, she rec then recognized and then paid her obeisance and said, but, you know, he was always wearing saffron and you're wearing white. So he explained why he was wearing white. He's still wearing white. We're going to tell the story of where he changed from white to saffron again. So he permitted her to cook for his disciples and offer to his shoes. <laughs> and he said to his disciples, Although Vidura wasn't el elevated by birth, Krishna ate his food, or his wife's food. So you can eat her food, and the scriptural authority for what he was authorizing. And after all the disciples ate, she noticed that Ramanuja hadn't eaten. So she asked him, what's the problem? He said, well, my disciples can eat what's offered to my, my shoes, but I can't. <laughs> she said, well, then, can I give you milk and fruit? You can offer it to your Lord in your own way, and then you can eat something. So he agreed. And after they had eaten, and after he had eaten, she had the remnants. And she took the remnants and offered the remnants 
along with water that had washed Ramanuja's feet, to her husband, who was asleep. She woke him up. He started eating the remnants, but noticed that she hadn't eaten. And he said, how come you're not eating? She said, I, I just have this one request of you. You please accept Ramanuja Charya as your guru, as I have done. And he, he agreed. So then she ate. And they all lived happily ever after. So, she's a very special person. Kangu Pirati. Kangu Pirati. Living in the forest. After some time, he crossed this Nila Giri mountain range. You follow along with that map that you, you should have received. And he went northwest heading for a particular place, a, a small lake, Vani Pushkarini. There they stayed for a few days, and then they went to another place that Ramanujacharya gave the name, Shalagram. He gave the name because there, there in that particular place, there were an, a number of Shaivites that recognized the tilak of these Vaishnavas and they weren't friendly. They, weren't, they didn't attack him, they just weren't friendly. So Ramanujacharya had a transcendental solution. He noticed, because he was there for a few days, there's a certain reservoir of water that the people of this area would go to get their water for their kitchens, for their drinking and cooking and this thing and that thing. And he asked one of his disciples, Dasarati, when no one's looking, put your feet in that lake. It'll sanctify the lake. So Dasarati did what Ramanuja said. And in the course of just a few days, their disposition changed and they became friendly. Receiving the foot wash of a Vaishnav. And then Ramanuja said, the fitting name for this place is Shalagram, or the stone symbol of Vishnu. That's the, how this translation reads. Now, I don't know, not necessarily chronological, because chronological, this is a scene back in Sri Rangam, but that's the way it, th this text is presented. Back in Sri Rangam, there was a devotee who was particularly had in exceptional faith, Acharya Nishta, in Ramanuja Acharya. And there's many examples and many examples. Very, very faithful disciple. Um, Valduga Nambi. Valduga Nambi. Nambi means? Means what? Face? Faith. F-A-I-T-H. Faith. Vaduga Nambi. Because there's another Nambi we're going to hear about. Vaduga Nambi. Acharya Nishta. Vaduga Nambi. He also had, as his worshipable deity, a pair of Ramanuja's padukas. So as they were one, on one occasion, more than one occasion, they would travel and Ramanuja Chari would take his personal deity with him and Paduga Nambi would carry the deities. One time Ramanuja noticed in the same carrying satchel with his deity was his shoes. And he asked, Numbi, what are you doing? He said, these shoes are as worshipful as your deities. That was his faith. And Ramanuja didn't correct him. There's another time when they were together in Ranganath. And uh, Ramanuja Charya asked, Numbi, come with me. Let's go see the deity. And 
in response, Nambi recited a verse from one of the Alvars, Munivahana Alvar, that, no, that says, my eyes which saw the beautiful form of the Lord were not seeing anything else. He just changed the form of the Lord and said, my eyes who have seen the form of Ramanuja cannot see anything else. And Ramanuja smiled. He understood the devotion of his disciple. Another time, because Nambi was regularly with Ramanuja, different circumstances, he would offer remnants of his meal to Nambi. And he noticed that Nambi, after receiving the remnants, he wouldn't wash his hands, but he would wipe his hands on his head. And Ramanuja said, what are you doing? That's not clean. You have to wash your hands. And so he went to wash his hands. Then later, Ramanuja Chari was given some Mahaprasad from the deity, and he gave, took some, gave some remnants to Nambi. And after, his, he, after taking the, the prasad of the deity, he washed his hands. And Ramanuja said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just following the instruction you gave the other day that I should have to wash my hands after eating. And Ramanuja said, you've defeated me. Reciprocation of a loving dealing between a guru and disciple who is very faithful to his guru. Another time, Nambi was boiling milk for Ramanuja. Ramanuja said, let's go see the deity. He said, I, if I go see the deity, then the milk will boil over. And this is more important to me than seeing the deity. And Ramanuja was very pleased. Now we don't imitate, by the way. Another time, this is the last one, his, his relatives, Nambi's relatives visited and they weren't Vaishnavas. After they left, he discarded all the cooking vessels, cleaned the place, disinfected it like it was, had been contaminated, and then he, Nambi, went to Dasarati and asked Dasarati for the discarded cooking vessels. Because, you know, after cooking vessels are discarded, you don't use them again. He used them again. With the understanding that the used par paraphernalia used in his spiritual master's service is worshipable. And anything that had to do with the non-Vaishnava, although they were his parents, was to be discarded. So now, after some further travel, they reached this place. Tondanur eastward from where they were to Tondunur. And that's where we are now, by the way, Tondunur. And um, as mentioned, this Tondunur was kind of like an outpost for the king. And the king's name was Vitala Devarai. He was the ruling king. And uh, he had this inspiration that he wanted to make a nice feast. And he was a religious man, so he was thinking to invite to this festival in honor of the Jains to have a nice feast for all of them. And his wife, he discussed with his wife, her name was Santala Devi. Santala Devi said, they won't accept your invitation. They won't accept your invitation because one of your fingers was chopped. Don't you remember? I mean, you surely remember, but when you were in Delhi and the Muslims knew that you weren't going to convert to Muslim faith, they chopped one of your fingers. And the Jains have a practice. They won't eat. Even in the house of a king, they won't eat from a person who has a chopped finger. So he said, no, they'll accept. So he went and asked and got this long explanation from a, a Jain leader confirming it's just our, it's our practice. 
We don't. We, we can't accept your. Don't 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 invite us because it'll be embarrassing because we won't come. So the king was furious. What? What kind of religion is this? And his wife said, "You know, our daughter has a problem." Our daughter is inhabited by some kind of a ghost. And this devotee, this Brahmana devotee, known by us as Nambi, he confided in me. We know, I know about your daughter and she has this problem. In your kingdom right now, there's a Vaishnav named Ramanujacharya who cured a similar person, a woman, who was inhabited by a Rakshasa ghost. And he somehow cured her. If you can allow, you can arrange for Ramanujachari just to cast his glance upon your daughter, she may become well. So Nambi told the queen, and the queen told her husband, why are you bothering with these Jain people? They're not going to accept your invitation. So why don't you just stop all that and Invite Ramanujacharya here. Because he won't do like that. Ramanujacharya won't do like that. And he has this magical power. Maybe he can cure our daughter. And so the king thought that was a nice idea. And he was already angry at the Jains. And so he sent a messenger to Ramanujacharya. Who's, who was living outside the capital area. The kingdom area of the king. And, you know, politely declined. You know, I, I, I am not attracted to opulence and fanfare. Thank you. And Nambi happened to be there at the time. And Nambi said, I suggest that you go. Because he's a good man. And he has this daughter situation. And if somehow you can help his daughter, he may become very helpful in your mission. So Ramanuja listened to that recommendation of Nambi. So he went. He went to the palace of the king and he was introduced to the king and the king said, I heard that you have this capacity. Maybe you can make my daughter well. So he said, bring me to your daughter. The daughter was in a com an, an area in the king's palace that men don't go because during those days there's a certain area where women go and no one but the husband may go, or the father may go. There's nobody else, no man allowed. He took Ramanujacharya, sannyasi, into that place. He saw the daughter, and he sprinkled some holy water on the daughter, and instantly, whatever the was that was inhabiting her, went away. And she looked around for the first time in normal consciousness, and she immediately became shy, went to a place where she dressed herself properly, and came forward again thanking Ramanujacharya profusely for rescuing her because she had awareness of what had been going on and now she's relieved of whatever had been going on. And the king was amazed. <laughs> it's like miracle cure. And he fell at Ramanuja's feet and because he, he had said to his wife, if he can cure my daughter, our daughter, I'll become his disciple. So he became a disciple. And he was given a nice name. Vishnu Vardhana Rai. And Vishnu Vardhana Rai became very helpful in spreading the message of devotion. So did you go to that temple up on the hill? The temple that shows that carving of Ramanujacharya sitting with the Anantashesha over him. Did you go to that temple? You're going there later. Four o'clock. Okay, so this is... You saw a picture. You should have seen a picture that was sent out to all the registrants. That is up on the hill back there is where that deity is, that where Ramanujacharya was. And when he, when he was there, at the temple of Lord Nishinga, when you see the deity of Lord Nishinga... He's not covered with gold or gold ornaments. He's just a, a black marble deity. So it took me a while to figure it out. And I was told, 
There are certain festivals. They took fixture during festival mm-hmm. time. Yoga Nishinga, where he has this strap around his knees, is sitting in a yoga posture. And um, Ramanu Jachari was worshipping there. And when he was staying there and worshipping there, personally. And when he was there, 12,000 Jains came in a confrontational mood to debate with him. He wasn't interested in debate <laughs> with Jains. But instead, Nambi said, look, this is, you know, a predicament. You're, I know, you're Ananta Shesh. Just display your identity or engage your identity and let these Jains hear the transcendental truth in your mood of Ananta Shesh. So he accepted. There's different versions. You saw the different versions. But behind a cloth, he exhibited with thousands of faces, thousands of explanations that's different than Jainism. And so that carving commemorates that pastime. It's up on the hill, you can see, in that Nishinga temple. They were angry because it was like, he's our king, and who are you? You know, us and them consciousness. Sometimes people have that consciousness. Over a period of time, although this whole area, because Ramanuja Acharya stayed here for some time, many, many, many persons became his disciples. Not like he was on a conversion campaign, but they just became so influenced by his Krishna consciousness, by his demeanor, and his dedication to the personality of Godhead and his bhakti and they became disciples. This area became a very important place because remember he stayed here for some number of years. Twelve years. Twelve years. That's a long time to stay in one place. I mean not just one place but this area. So it became uh, in- influenced by bhakti, by his presence. The king became very moved and took stones from Jain edifices and used it to build a nice, um, safe place for water. Looking at the picture. Drainage of the river Yadava for a beneficial work for the people of the area. So he took stone from the Jain edifices and public works as the, as the king for the benefit of everybody. So it's somewhere here, um, <clears throat> there's, well, this temple that's across the street, the description that, that's in this biography, the image that I had was a little different than what we see here, but he had, in a dream, he had a dream where Narayana appeared to him in a dream. This deity of Narayana appeared to him in a dream and said, I've been waiting. Please come and find me. I've been neglected for a long, long time. And here's how you can find me, a second dream. In between this type of tree, that type of tree, there's a, there's a mound. On top of the mound, there's many Tulsi plants growing. That's where I am in my deity form. Please come rescue me. I want you to worship me. So he went, according to those dreams, and with the king's help, he began excavating what was in his dream. And sure enough, there was the deity of Narayana. And he began worshiping the deity of Narayana after properly reinstalling the deity restoring the deity and reinstalling the deity. And at that place, there's a pond, a Pushkarini, Veda Pushkarini, and that's a place, a celebrated place, where it is said that Dattatreya accepted um, cloth of renunciate. 
So at that place, because of the history of Dattatreya, he also took off the white and put on saffron attire once again. All this time he's been incognito. And according to this biography, he's now 80 years of age. And in his dream, there was also a need to uh, have tilak because they ran out of tilak. They had been away from Sri Rangam for a long time. And, you know, as a Vaishnava, he wanted tilak. So, in a dream, it also appeared on the northeast corner of this pond, you'll find all the tilak you're looking for. So, he came with his danda poked his dunda into the earth, and sure enough, there was all the tilak. He didn't have to go to a tilak store. He just was right there in the earth. Now he had tilak and Narayan to worship. One more obstacle. With the worship of a deity... Commonly, there's an Utsav Murti, at least that's the tradition in, in Ramanuja's line. So there was no Utsav Murti for the worship of Narayan. In a dream, the Utsav Murti appeared. I mean, he didn't sleep too much, but his sleeping was transcendental. So the Utsav Murti had the name Rama Priya. This is a very nice story. Very nice story. Rama Murti appeared to him in a dream and said, I'm now in Delhi under the care of the Turkish king. Go there and bring me here. So he went to, to Delhi and went to the palace of the king, the Turkish king. Now that could be risky in itself, but he went to the palace of the Turkish king and because of, because of his elevated spiritual stature, the Turkish king gave him audience and he explained to the king what his mission was, that the Utsav Murti, my deity of Narayana, is somewhere in your king's treasury, you know, because kings would loot and they put the loot in their treasury. So he, the king invited him, please, please come look around in my treasure, see what you can find. He couldn't find. He had another dream. And the deity said, the king's daughter is treating me like a plaything. So he told the king, your daughter has the, the Utsav Murti. So Listen to this. The king took Ramanujacharya into the place where his daughter was, again in a place where no man goes in the, in the palace of the king. And sure enough, there was the daughter playing with the deity. Like this was her husband. And Ramanujacharya walked into the room and the deity jumped off the table and the deity went running with arms outstretched <laughs> to Ramanujacharya who picked up the deity and embraced the deity like a mother and her being reunited, reunited with her lost child. And the king gave permission. I mean, after, after seeing that, <laughs> what are you going to do? You, you may take the, the Ramapriya with you. So the daughter was attached. And his, the father said, what can I do? This is their religion. And this is their deity. So I, I can't say no. The Turkish king, I can't say no. He is respectful of another's faith. I can't say no. The daughter said, but I'm attached to my God. 
So if he's, he's their God, he's my God. So I want to go with him. If he's going, I want to go with him. So his father said, okay. Her father said, okay. So the daughter of the king is going with Ramanujacharya back here to receive the baby up by the side of the deity of Narayan, the Utsavmurti. However, when they crossed tracts of land where there was Hindu prevalence, not Turkish prevalence, they wouldn't let her enter. So she went alone through the wilderness to be with Ramapriya. And when she got to the place, Ramapriya was in the temple, and they wouldn't let her in the temple because she wasn't Hindu. Bad idea. That's not a good rule. So she sat down, meditated on the Supreme Lord, and gave up her life. According to the biography, she entered into the body of the deity. She was pretty devoted and held the Rama Priya deity, not just like a, a, a doll, a, a plaything, but her life and soul. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Meanwhile, it's been 12 years when Ramanujacharya had not been in Sri Rangam because of the Chola king. So he uh, was visited by a, a messenger. By the way, at, at one point in time when they continued their journey, they sent one forest man with one of his disciples back to Sri Rangam for the news. When is it safe to return to Sri Rangam? So one disciple, this is saying it was the same disciple, but someone came, a messenger came from Sri Rangam with the news. And Ramanujachari wanted to know, what's, what, what is the situation with the temple? And also, equally important, what about my spiritual master, Mahapurna, and my dear disciple, Kuresha? What happened? Because he knew that they were taken by the Chola king. So it's, it's a very unpleasant story. In fact, the, the, the biography says, rather than describe it, better to just imagine it. So I'm not going to go into too much other than what it says. The Chola king confronted both of them. They wanted them to sign this little document that says there's no higher power than Lord Shiva. Will you sign it? Or else? So Kresha was first, and Kresha gave a long explanation because, oh, by the way, the Chola king wasn't following the Vedas. He, the Chola king, had some other scripture that he called scripture, which wasn't scripture, but he called it scripture, saying all these things about Lord Shiva that's not in scripture. And when he heard uh, Kresha recite scripture, 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 and very sensible things from scripture, the king was angered. Look, you're a clever man. Are you going to sign this thing or not? So he's a clever person. What he said was, I'll sign it. Give it to me. And he added, this is a celebrated little passage. The Sanskrit, dronam asti tata param, after shivat parataram nasti, which means there isn't a, 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 there is no one superior to Lord Shiva. Na asti. Paratram. Shiva paratram nasti. Shiva is the greatest personality. He wrote, Dronam asti tata param. Dronam asti tata param. And then signed it. So what's, it's just a pun. Because the word Drona and Shiva can be used for weights. And Shiva is a certain weight, and Drona has more weight. So there's no, no, no greater weight than Shiva, but the Drona is greater than Shiva. And the king understood, look, you're finished. I'm going to poke out your eyes. And Kresha said, no worries, I'll do it myself. Because eyes that have seen a person like you, shouldn't, I shouldn't carry them anymore. 
And right in front of everybody in this assembly, he poked out his own eyes. Croatia. Blood gushing all over the place. And then there's Mahapurna, who is elder. Croatia is Ramanuja's disciple. And Mahapurna is the, the guru of Ramanuja. So Mahapurna is there. And King, called, Joe the King said, you saw what happened to Croatia. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to sign this or not? And he gave his explanation of why he couldn't. He just couldn't. He couldn't sign it. He couldn't be dishonest. And so, the Chola king ordered his men to poke out his eyes. And so, they did. Right in that public assembly. So, it's not nice. So I, I'm not inclined to read the rest. Or to even speak too much about it. But, Kuresha had a daughter, and the daughter now has a father, and Ramanuja Charya's spiritual master were both blind. She led them by the hand to leave the presence of the Chola king in his palace or kingdom, wherever he, wherever he did his thing, and cleaned the blood streaming down their face and tried to revive them the best she could. And Kuresha was courageous, but uh, and that's her father. But Mahapurna was very old and couldn't bear it. I mean, just too much. So when they got outside, he just laid down on the ground, and she was at his feet. Kuresha uh, was holding his head. And she's crying and crying and saying, what misfortune. You're born in Sri Rangam and you're leaving your body in the Chola king's kingdom. What a great misfortune. And different, different ways of feeling very sorry. And then he spoke transcendental teachings right up to the very end of his life. So the transcendental teachings included, don't you know that according to scripture, there's no more favorable place to live, to, to live your body than in the association of Vaishnavas. And when you're hearing the glorification of the Holy Name and the Supreme Lord in the company of Vaishnavas, there's no better place. Don't you know that when Jatayu left his body, even in the wilderness, Lord Ram was there to be with him? And so I'm, I'm not in Sri Rangam, but if, if it's, it's dependent upon being in Sri Rangam to leave your body because otherwise it's not auspicious, then what about all the other Vaishnavas that aren't going to die in Sri Rangam? That's not right. So he, then he spoke, to, you know, he was preaching to her <laughs> on his deathbed. And her, 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 her Mahapurna was a transcendentalist completely. He said, what a good fortune. You have taken my eyes so that you can give me my eyes. My eye, my, give me my eyes is so that I can, I can see with faith the presence of the personality of Godhead. And he gave up his life, Mahapurna. So all this is being relayed to Ramanujacharya here or somewhere here. And this is his spiritual master and his dear, dear disciple, Kuresha. And he, you know, his equilibrium maintained for a little while, but he lost it. He started wailing and rolling on the ground. Transcendental separation. And then, as is, as is done, like when Sampati knew that Jatayu had been killed, he did the rituals, Sampati. So Ma Ramanujacharya, on, on his spiritual master's behalf, he did the appropriate rituals right here, although his spiritual master had already left this world.
concluding. That's not the end of Ramanujacharya's life, and eventually he returned back to Sri Rangam, etc. But what are, what are some of the lessons that we've we can learn? I'll invite you ahead of time. One of the last classes, if not the last class, is sharing. And one of the things I'm going to encourage in the sharing is practical application. Aside from really amazing histories of these really amazing Vaishnavas, we're going to hear some more of it this evening, that late afternoon. Amazing personalities. But more than their amazingness is the examples that they're setting. For example, the greatness of a Vaishnava may be considered in terms of the numbers of followers or miracles or some wondrous uh, accomplishments. We go, wow. And that's certainly wonderful. But that's not the major lesson to learn from all of this. For example, Ramanujacharya, according to the Madhva, according to the Sri Vaishnavas, is Anantashesh. And what's an Anantashesh running from Sri Rangam? Because there's a, a bad guy. He's an Anantashesh. He can wipe him out and finish the whole thing. Of course, there's a leela of the Supreme Lord to be performed, including the sacrifice of Kuresha and Mahapurna. But he's acting as if he's one of us, taking exclusive shelter in the Supreme Lord. So that's a lesson that we can learn. We're not an Antishesh. And there may be circumstances that we face and how to, how to deal with circumstances that are beyond us, clearly beyond us. Complete faith, one, two, three, four. And every, every one of those four and everything after that was full shelter in the personality of Godhead. If you can recall the sequence of what he did including the, the, the army members chasing after him and crossing this shallow river. He just turned to the, the, the prayers of the Alvars, threw some sand in their tracks, and left everything up to the personnel who got it. I mean, we're not powerful like him, but it's a principle of relying completely on the personnel who got it. It's okay. Why, what about creation and... <laughs> You know, th those kinds of questions come. But, you know, they're example-setting personalities also. And when, when you take up spiritual life, there's challenge. Prabhupada said it thousands of times. And it's true. And the challenge may be this. The challenge may be that. It may not be life-threatening. But there's challenges. And if you haven't had a challenge, you're missing out. Because challenges can mean, you know, an opportunity for taking deeper shelter. It's just part of the territory. The deeper shelter territory. When there's obstacles that you don't know what to do. What do you do when you don't know what to do? The obstacle is not likely to just evaporate. You take shelter of the personality of Godhead. Like Draupadi, you know, that nice example. Hey Krishna, hey Govinda. What do you do? Take shelter in adversity and in prosperity. So there, there's, there's lessons, you know, but let's say vicariously, just to, 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 to in, the, in the mundane sense. Supposing, so, supposing somebody has some partiality for a political view or some partiality for a sporting competition and somebody like a, a favorite sporting team and you celebrate because your favorite sporting team is is winning and if they don't winning then you're sad and you know these mundane emotions can be 
pasted on spiritual practice. And then, you know, the, 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 the guru should be the one that has this and that and the other thing. A lot of five gold stars after the report card. They have a lot of this and that and that's missing the under, that's missing the message. So, and times our acharyas are showing to us how to, what's the standard of success? It's not numbers or specific necessarily attainments. It's full faith in the personality of Godhead and character that goes with one who has that characteristic. That's success. Krishna consciousness is not measured otherwise. So, I, I'll say it again. I invite you all to give thought. So many of you are taking notes, which is really nice, and some of you have good memories. You don't need to take notes. But reflect, because we'll have some time before our next class, and at the end of the day, etc. I'm most likely... You did that on this long journey to come to where we are and reflect on what we've heard. And then the application points, meaningful application points for you, not for somebody else, for you. So you can go the next step, next step, next step. And not just be guided by sentiment, but be guided by proper understanding. And the, the lives of our acharyas are to, to give us that inspiration, role models, not to imitate, but to follow in, in the footsteps of lessons they're imparting to all of us. And that's a big part of why we're here. And a, a, really, a really nice thing, one last thing. We're kind of separated from the routine. I mean, some people aren't so separated from the routine, but most of us are. What we normally do is not this. But for so many days, we have some more days, and it's, it's, there's some transformation that's going on inside. And so the, the conclusion of our time together is, what are you going to take with you? The trans, tra transformation agents that you're going to take with you. Meaningful, lessons learned, and how to apply them. I'm encouraging that. Think about it now, so we'll have nice discussion in our final class and then it, you'll take it with you. Many of us have a long journey to go back to where we came from. And it, it may be really easy just to think, okay, what's the next thing, next thing? So I'm, I'm encouraging, don't just think like that. Think, what, what have I, what, how can I receive and go another step in my life of devotion to Krishna? You follow. I'm sure you follow. So, how are we doing with time? Who is our timekeeper? How are we doing with time? Do we have time for questions or no? What? 15 minutes. I see one hand up. Do we have a microphone? Yes. Okay. Rikrishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, I have uh, multiple questions. Let's do one at a time. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, from today's class, uh, what I could understand was that uh, the followers of Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya and Gaudiya Vaishnavas all have different destinations. Like, only the Gaudiya Vaishnavas uh, consider uh, Golok Vrindavan to be the highest. And uh, other sampradayas, they consider... Uh, uh, Other the, things. Uh, yes, Maharaj. So that means they cannot uh, reach Golok Vrindavan in a sense. Does that, is it, is it correct? That's what you understood from today's class? I mean, uh, that's not from not, today's not class not at all. But, uh, Earlier. Okay. Well, they don't even have a conception mm -hmm. what to speak of attain. The gift that Madhvacharya was giving was not that one. The gift that Ramanujacharya was giving was not that one. The gift that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was giving was that one. 
And now, now all followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu want that gift, but at least, you know, the singularity of exclusive devotion to the personal, if you got it. Jnana karma avratam. That much. Pure bhakti. How's that for a short answer? Yes, Maharaj, I can understand. And one more. One more. One more, one more only. Uh, so today, mostly we saw how the DT reciprocates in uh, many cases, how the DT is reciprocating. So uh, in an earlier uh, Shankaracharya's class, we had heard that they first... Uh, do saguna worship and yes. they go to nirguna worship yes and when uh, they are doing the saguna worship they are worshiping the deity they are seeing the form of the lord also so how is it that their heart does not change when they see the beautiful form of the lord well and the, the answer was given by vishwanath chakravarti thakur take the microphone from him the answer given by vishwanath chakravarti thakur was their their hearts are hard and they're cheaters because of a predisposition. Now, we give them credit for being focused on their goal and control of their mind and senses to achieve that goal. We give them credit for that. And being faithful to the guru that taught them that. So there are three things we give them credit for. But their hearts are hard and they're cheaters. So, you know, it's not like sticking our tongue out at them and calling them a bad name. It's That's... That's the situation. And when they're, they're very focused. Saguna to Nirguna. And very focused. And that specific example, as you remember, is, is a, a commentary on Bhagavatam Canto 3, Chapter 28, but also the Bhagavad Gita verse. Klesho Dikataras Tesham. So that's Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's explanation. It's not easy. It's difficult. How is it possible? They're very determined. And their concept of transcendence is that one. And their concept of transcendence is not saguna. Their concept of saguna is that's a stepping stone to get to nirguna. Nirguna is transcendence. A means to get to where we want to go. The classic example, you've heard this one, was in one of those lines. You use a ladder to get some height and then you toss the ladder away. It, it's just utilitarian. You use the ladder to get to a high place. That's all. You don't need the ladder after that. Like that. It's disrespectful. Fundamentally disrespectful. Hard. So your, your question is how, how can they? Their hearts are hard. And they're cheaters. And they're fundamentally disrespectful. What can, what can we say? <laughs> it's true. Someone else in the back has their hand up. Go ahead, turn the speaker. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Guru Maharaj, in many times... Not so loud. A little bit softer, please. Thank you. So many times in the uh, life we have... It so happens that we face problems, yes, <coughs> difficulties, we, yes. we are stuck. And then yes. uh, as we hear in the class, we try to take the shelter of the Lord. Uh, we pray to the Lord. Uh, we pray, pray, and we see that, or especially I see that nothing would change. Okay. Then my faith in the prayers or in the shelter of the Lord would slowly decrease. Uh, I don't see anything change. Uh, so... Favorable change, I mean uh, to say. So how do we tackle with this situation? Guru how Maharaj? do you tackle it? You don't try to tackle it, first of all. Tackle it as you, you're the doer. How do I tackle it? The, the, there is a nice explanation which we're going to hear in a short while. But it has, the answer is, it has everything to do with the faith of the person who's giving the prayer. It doesn't have anything to do with the capacity of the prayer or the person who is being prayed unto. Say it again. It has everything to do with the faith of the person offering the prayer. Faith. And with faith carrying out the orders of the spiritual master. Remember that 
little teaching we heard. Obedience is the first law of discipline. To be a disciple, there must be discipline. To be disciplined, there's obedience. To have obedience, there's faith. And so, proportionate to one's faith, or one could say proportionate to one's purity, then there's reciprocation. So, what you should do, you don't tackle the situation. What you should do is look inside and say, Moo. <laughs> I need further purification because if my heart was pure, I wouldn't be in this tackle the situation perplexity. There'd be a different kind of reciprocation. And when the different kind of reciprocation comes, supposing it doesn't look favorable, it could be more difficulty and more difficulty and more difficulty, and then you would take the position, Krishna, you're very kind. That's the faithful person's response and the pr person who is on the path to purity. I don't need to say it again. I think you got it. What you do is look at, you introspect. Where is there, there's not a lack in the process or the person who is the deliverer of mercy. The lack is over here. And, and where is that lacking? It has to do with anartas that which blocks the light of the sun, the clouds in the sky. The sun isn't shining less. There's clouds in the sky. So there's clouds in my heart, blocking. What, what are those clouds, and what are the measures that I can take to remove those clouds? And however long it takes, that's how long it takes. Let me follow the process with faith in the instructions, and thus discipline and that then comes purity and then comes the reciprocation however Krishna wants to reciprocate however Krishna here, I, here's something I like there's one of the many things I like one of the things I like is one of the tests that Lord Nishingadev Lord Vishnu had when Prahlad was being tossed off the cliff he didn't show himself he wanted to see, what's Prahlad going to do? Is he going to scream? Is he going to complain, whine and complain? What's he going to do? So, you know, you're Prahlad being tossed off a cliff. Maybe. <coughs> Which reminds me, the Nishinga deity that you're going to see, right? You haven't seen yet? You're going to go now. Okay, so when you go up the hill, it is said that Prahlad Maharaj installed that deity of Lord Dev. And it is said, I don't know that, that, you know how and when and anything, the deity in here, there's a, there's a deity of Krishna that Yudhisthira installed and worshipped during Dwarpa Yuga. Now, what was the when and the circumstance? I don't know that history, but it is commonly said. In fact, it's the, 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 I, don't, I don't speak the language of the Pujari, but he was explaining. He, he, he Yudhisthira, worshipped this deity of Krishna. The Utsav Murti is Krishna holding a flute. The forearm form is Krishna and Dwaraka with symbols of Vishnu. And that's the deity that Yudhisthira worship. So, I mean, there's, there's enormous... So, how do we know any of that? It's hearing from authorities that we have a reliable source of authority. So, just do that. That's how you tackle it. You don't tackle it. You faithfully follow. And by, by that faithful following, the Lord reciprocates. Is that all right? You sure? Wait till the next test comes. You'll see if it's okay. Here, here's a nice Prabhupada said. There's something over here. Prabhupada said, When you pray to Krishna, my dear Lord Krishna, please engage me in your loving service. 
Krishna may say, Oh, he wants to en be engaged in my service? What about a little sense gratification? Hmm? Prabhupada's voice went like that. Hmm? And the devotee will say, No. Prabhupada sitting on the asas and turned his head, No, I only want you. Krishna may say, Oh, maybe he really wants me. What about a little trouble? Hmm? And the devotee passes through the trouble, and the devotee says, Whatever you want to send my way, that's okay, but I just want to be engaged in your service. And Krishna may say, Oh, he really wants me. Let me give myself to him. That's another way of saying this other statement. You know, purity is, is what... This is, this is Bhakti Siddhanta. That other one is Bhakti Siddhanta's teaching. But it's, you know, it's true. Everything is dependent upon the, the sincerity and purity of the practitioner. There's, there's many nice examples from Scripture on this. Something over here. Hare Krishna Maharaj. <clears throat> Maharaj, like uh, you told in the previous class about mass killing of Sri Vaishnavas as Sri Rangam when Turkish invasion happened. So, was it because of the result of offense to Vedanta Deshika? And uh, and like some of them may be the pure devotees, so why didn't Lord Ranganath protect them as he did in some other cases, like deities protected the priest when they were invaded? Uh, yeah, you have to ask the Supreme Lord. He's a swift deliverer, and it may not be the way that you, or the device of thinks your, your deliverance should look like. And he's not, my, it may not be, my, my response may not be satisfying, but it's, it's true. The a simple way that I express, when you surrender to the personality of Godhead, you surrender on his terms, not yours. And if he wants this, it's this. And if he wants that, it's that. And don't whine and complain, wait a minute, that wasn't my terms. Now, why would he choose that instead of this? Swift deliverer. Maybe, maybe so many maybes. Maybe he wanted them to move on, maybe... To, to some other better situation, maybe so many maybes. Maybe he wanted to take them right away to Vaikuntha. So many maybes. But it, he's the well-wisher of his devotees. Death is going to come inevitably for everyone, and w the, the shape and form of that is not in our hand. So why does the Lord do this instead of that, is the question. And some this and some that. You know, some persons he protects in, the, in our sense of what protection is, and some persons he doesn't protect in our sense of what doesn't protect looks like. He's protecting. And our ability to understand how he's protecting is limited by our Krishna consciousness. The boundaries of our coverings can't see beyond that. It's a little bit like his question. You know, supposing my faith is weak. But supposing your faith isn't weak. The Lord is bringing those devotees to him. Swiftly. I think we should end. You want something? Do you want a jivara? On a bus ride, one of the bus rides, I was talking with one devotee <laughs> about this very topic. And um, one of the examples we were talking about is of uh, Abhimanyu. And so it stemmed from the comment you had made how you gave an example of a devotee who couldn't even see the deities of Lord Ram because of the sorrow 
and the pain that yes, the, yes. the past time. So then we were discussing about how the story of Abhimanyu invokes similar sorrow. It's very hard to go through that story. And then even this story of oh, Quraysh, it, and it, hurt. it, it hurts a lot. I guess I wanted to share that it seems like, I, I, I ask a question. This is very deep to yes. understand. Yes. To take shelter of the Supreme Lord is what success really is. Yes, that's the message. That's the message. And uh, uh, Mike, I guess the, the comment I was going to make to for clarification is for uh, when we when such things happen that seem unjust and unfair and really atrocious for another devotee. Yes. For us to respond, like how Ramana Jacharya responded wailing after some time, is is okay and natural. Yes. At the same time, if something were to happen to us personally, the encouragement is to go deeper yes. and find that shelter in the Supreme Lord. Yes. Now, he had transcendental attachment. He didn't have <laughs> mundane attachment. And transcendental attachment, it's, it's like the statement that Prabhupada made which is true, that when, this, that when the spiritual master departs, the disciple should cry. Not like that's an instruction, but it's natural that, you know, the, the spiritual master isn't spiritually gone away, physically, the soul, the soul is no longer in the body. So one feels something, and that feeling of something should be. But that, as you said, to go, to go deeper. I liked very much how Mahapurna responded. He preached. He was fixed. He wasn't filled with sorrow. It is, you know, the, the daughter of creation was filled with sorrow. Looking this. So for her to feel those feelings is natural. For him to do what he did is, is a lesson giver. The, real, the deeper is... How are you attached? To what are you attached? And how? And that's going to be examined. This way, that way, or another way. And these stories can help us take a look at inside, deeper. What does it mean to be an Acharya? What does it mean to be a, a devotee that has no karma and gan? What does that mean? What does that look like for me? Not for a storybook person. And these aren't, these are persons out for me. These are persons that weren't from Mahabharata times or Ramayana times. These are more contemporary. And they have the same character, same disposition. Full surrender. That's the test. That's the test. That's the instruction and that's the test. So what does it look like? It's going to be look a little different for different persons. We're all going to get our opportunity for varieties of tribulation and certainly death. So how are we going to face it? Back to this question of you know things that you don't know how we're going to handle. Well, how do how do you how do you tackle it? Shelter in all circumstances. Okay. We're ready for your nice announcements. Yes, sir.